This is a great description of what heaven will be like. The next to last chapter of the Bible describes this beautiful scene where God wipes away our tears and receives us. Please read with me. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Let's stand for the gospel reading. It's the 12th chapter of John, beginning at the 20th verse. Jesus entered Jerusalem for the last time to celebrate the Passover festival. Here, Jesus' words about seeds planted in the ground turn the disaster of his death into the promise of a harvest in which everyone will be gathered. John writes, we read, Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to them, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me the Father will honor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Today is the final Sunday of Lent, so this is the final Sunday in our Lenten sermon series on suffering. Thank you for not clapping. I appreciate that. Finding hope in the midst of suffering, that's been our topic. As a parish, we've been discussing suffering. Some of you have the book, Man's Search for Meaning, written by Viktor Frankl, who was a concentration camp survivor. Suffering has not been an easy topic for us, certainly. But no one gets out of here without suffering. We are not promised a suffering-free life. It comes with being alive. I do not know a way around suffering, but I do know a way through it. In the last resort, we have a Lord who suffered. This will be made clear in the coming days leading up to Easter, as we will remember his betrayal, his arrest, his being tortured and whipped and tried, and in the end, his death on the cross. Jesus suffered. He suffered, we recently studied the suffering of Jesus in the confirmation class, and I asked the class, why did Jesus have to suffer? And one of our students said, very quietly, but with confidence, Jack said, for us. Jesus suffered for us. I love that answer, Jack. He suffered for us. Here is a God who stands alongside with us, involved. A God who identifies with us. Then the result and the reality of suffering is so evident once and for all on the cross. All the horror, the cruelty, the suffering of the word on full display on the cross. Nowhere do we see the result of suffering clearer than Jesus is dying, that God is a God for us, a God who's completely on our side. Not a fear-creating, theocratic God from above, but a benevolent, involved, compassionate God with us here below, suffering with us even. Not a cruel, legalistic God, but a God who encounters us with redeeming love, a God who does not just demand love, 
but who bestows love, who gives love. In fact, we say God is love. God's love for us was best revealed when God sent into the world God's only Son so that we might have life through him. And that is the scandal of the Christian faith. Other religions just can't understand or don't want to believe that we have a God who becomes like one of us and, and not just identifies with us, but becomes one of us. And that even means that God suffers. God suffers and dies as a result of suffering. There are many who believe that God is aloof and abstract, beyond all suffering, sort of apathetic transcendence. But we believe that God's compassion is revealed to us ultimately in Jesus' passion on the cross. There are many who believe in a remote, abstract judge of a God, but we have a God who in Jesus unconditionally embraces our suffering, makes our suffering his suffering, making it possible for us to endure suffering, knowing that suffering has meaning and that in the end, we too will be raised up just as was Jesus. So God's love does not protect us from suffering. It protects us in suffering. And the victory of God always rings out so clearly to me in the last few pages of the Bible, that lesson that we read from the book of Revelation, where it says, Revelation 21, verse 5, God will be their God. God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, and no more sadness. The past is gone. Behold, God is making all things new. That's a beautiful passage of Scripture. In our congregational text that we're reading, Man's Search for Meaning, we read that suffering ceases to be suffering the very moment it finds a meaning. Viktor Frankl, the author of this book, writes that the meaning of life is found in every moment of living. The life never ceases to have meaning, even in our suffering and even in our death. Good Friday is just a few days away. We make a bold claim as Christians that suffering is redemptive, that God suffers with us, and that by the suffering of Jesus, we are somehow healed. Let me close this sermon by reading you a passage from this book. If you have the book, it's on page 69. I'm sorry, I've reached that point in life. There was this young woman whose death I witnessed in the concentration camp. It is a simple story. There is little to tell, and it sounds as if I had invented this story, but it really is like a poem. This young woman knew that she would die in the next few days, but when I talked to her, she was cheerful in spite of knowing she was going to die. She told me, I am grateful that fate has hit me so hard. She said, in my former life, I was spoiled. I did not take spiritual accomplishments seriously. And she pointed through the window of her hut. She said, you see this tree? This tree here is the only friend I have in my loneliness. Through the window, she could just see one branch of a chestnut tree. And on that branch, there were two blossoms. She said to me, I often talk to this tree. I was startled. I didn't quite know how to take her words. Was she delirious? Did she have occasional hallucinations? So anxiously I asked her, does the tree ever reply? Yes, she said. What did it say to you, I asked. She answered, it said to me, I am here. I am here. I am life. I am eternal life. Amen.